In the late 1980s, following an absence of nearly 25 years, a legendary Franco-Italian car mark, which was often considered gone forever, was revived on a model worthy to live up to the name of its founder, the Bugatti EB110, a crisp, low-slung machine that threw its hat into the ring of the supercar wars, taking hold of the motoring world. But sadly, despite being unequivocally the most revolutionary supercar of its era, this wasn't enough to help it break out against its many venerable rivals. The Bugatti Mark takes its name from the company founder, Italian automobile designer Ettore Bugatti, who established the firm in 1909 from a factory in Molsheim in the Alsace, which at the time was located in Germany on lands which had been captured during the Franco-Prussian War of 1870, rapidly making a name for himself by developing some of the fastest, most luxurious and technologically advanced road cars of his day. While during World War I, Bugatti contributed significant sums to the French war effort and even designed aircraft engines for the French Air Force. Throughout the 1920s and into the 1930s, Bugatti's car firm continued to deliver a superb range of luxury tourers and sports cars, even seeing victory at the Monaco Grand Prix, while his ventures also spread beyond the realm of automobiles to the design of aircraft, including the Bugatti Model 100 unlimited racing plane and railway vehicles such as the motorised autorail Bugatti for the French railways, the streamlined styling of which would form the basis of the legendary A4 Pacifics of the UK, the fastest steam locomotives in the world, which would even dub the name of their tapered front the Bugatti Nose. Sadly, Bugatti's success would quickly meet with various tragedies, as only days before the start of World War II, Ettore's son, Jean, was killed on August 11, 1939, at the age of 30 while testing a Bugatti Type 57 tank-bodied race car near the Molsheim factory. While during the subsequent war, the Bugatti plant was requisitioned by the forces of Nazi Germany, eventually being destroyed by Allied air raids. Bugatti unable to restart his firm, as due to his Italian origins, the French government saw fit to harass Ettore and confiscate all his remaining property, despite the fact that he had neither collaborated with the Nazis or his own countrymen in fascist Italy. Ettore Bugatti slipping into a severe mental decline and dying a broken man in a Parisian convalescent home in August 1947 at the age of 65. With Bugatti's passing, the planned comeback of the Type 73 and the Type 73C Grand Prix racers was postponed indefinitely, and Roland Bugatti, Ettore's second son from his first marriage, was unable to keep the company afloat, the post-war French car market being particularly unfavourable towards luxury marks, and thus assuring the company's rapid demise by 1953, as had been the case for other luxury French car makers such as Delahaye. Over the next two decades, attempts to revive the Bugatti car firm included the construction of the Type 251 Grand Prix race car, a transversely mid-mounted machine that illustrated avant-garde construction methods, but was powered by an archaic straight-eight power unit which led to underwhelming performance, the car's outing at the 1956 French Grand Prix leading to the car having to retire from the race after only 18 of the 61 laps, while in the early 1960s, former Chrysler designer Virgil Exner brought the Bugatti company into his own attempt to revive long-dormant car marks including Packard, Duesenberg and Stutz, with his proposal for a new Bugatti involving the mating of the last surviving Type 101 chassis with the final Type 57 straight-8 Bugatti engine, commissioning the Carrozzeria Ghia to build the new body. The resultant convertible, which was launched at the 1965 Turin Auto Show, receiving less than stellar reviews, and Exner abandoned any further work to bring Bugatti back to the forefront of motoring. It wouldn't be until 22 years later, in 1987, that through the instigation of Ferruccio Lamborghini, founder of the eponymous sports car and farm machinery builder, the Italian industrialist Romano Artioli would attempt to revive the brand once again after buying the rights to the company name, Lamborghini desiring his involvement in a new sports car project after selling his shares in the Lamborghini company in 1981, employing the services of ex-Lamborghini engineers Paolo Stanzani and Marcello Gandini, the designers behind the famous Lamborghini Miura and Lamborghini Countach, Artioli, as an accomplished car dealer and importer in one of Europe's wealthiest regions, being brought aboard to help provide financial backing. However, following early disagreements between Lamborghini and Artioli as to the direction of the proposed model, the latter of whom desired their new Bugatti project to be the most outrageous automotive endeavour in terms of design and styling, Ferruccio eventually left the project due to these creative differences which allowed Artioli and Stanzani to begin purchasing the rights to the Bugatti name from the French aerospace manufacturer Snemka, which had formerly been a car company itself and had bought the license to the firm in 1968 following its unsuccessful revival under Virgil Exner. The procurement of the company name, allowing the two men, 
working alongside enthusiast and automotive historian Jean-Marc Borel to establish the new Bugatti company in Luxembourg. As the three men were passionate Bugatti lovers, with Artioli having several historic examples in his private collection, the trio wanted to create a model that was worthy of Ettore's original vision, with Borel managing the holdings while Ettore's own son from his second marriage, Michel Bugatti, was on the board of directors, Artioli leading the Bugatti Automobili firm, with 35% of the Bugatti International Holding Company being held by Techno Stile, a highly regarded independent engineering company employing former Lamborghini personnel the revived Bugatti establishing its new factory at the very heart of Italian sports car territory in Campo Gaiano, a picturesque village on the outskirts of Modena, the sighting of this facility not only placing it within a few miles of rivals Maserati, Lamborghini, Ducati and Di Tommaso, but also within easy reach of the many contractors who serve these companies. One of the most important parts of the revived Bugatti was to ensure its presence in the supercar market was immediately apparent, and differed significantly from its rivals. The monumental factory, with huge EB initials etched into its brute concrete walls, being designed by Artioli's cousin, famed architect Giampaolo Benedini. While the spacious facility was laid out in such a manner that it gave employees an open-air environment to work in rather than the congested, cramped assembly lines of other car builders, public and worker relations being the most important part of his ethos, as he set the company on course to develop a model, which would easily outdo the three existing contenders of the supercar wars, the Porsche 959 of 1986, the Ferrari F40 of 1987, and the Jaguar XJ220 concept car of 1988. Paolo Stanzani fronted the development project together with Techno Stile, envisioning the underpinnings of the car, with both Artioli, Stanzani, and the principal Techno Stile team of Achille Benvini, Tiziano Benedetti, and Oliviero Pedrazzi, agreeing that the car should push all pre-established boundaries for a mid-engined V12 supercar looking back to their experience when developing the pioneering Miura of the 1960s, with Stanzani proposing early on a modest V12 power unit which was no larger than 3.5 litres, but was aided by turbochargers, this somewhat compact engine ensuring moderate weight loss, while the turbochargers compensated for the engine's smaller size, this configuration being married to carbon brakes and active suspension, but sadly these ambitious ideas were dropped due to time constraints. At the same time, Proposals were also made for an all-aluminium honeycomb chassis, and in association with four of the world's most preeminent car stylists, Paolo Martin of Pininfarina, Giorgetto Gigiaro of Ital Design, Nuccio Bertoni of the eponymous Carrozzeria Bertoni, and Marcello Gandini also of Bertoni, each of whom delivered striking concepts, the most radical of which coming from Paolo Martin, who had made a name for himself creating outlandish designs including the stylish Fiat 130 Coupe, the futuristic Ferrari Modulo, and the highly controversial Rolls-Royce Camargue. Martin's eventual creation, the 110 PM1 prototype, incorporating a panoramic windshield and a floating rear wing, integrated within the diagonal character line, starting behind the front wheels, the primary goal of the design being to achieve the highest aerodynamic efficiency, but it proved to be too excessive to make it to the production stage. Proposals by Giorgetto Gigiaro with his ID90, which adopted a silver teardrop shape with retro wheels, didn't sit well with Artioli, although his failure to design the definitive new Bugatti wasn't in vain, as Gigiaro simply repurposed the styling for the 1990 Turin Motor Show alongside the Aztec Barchetta, and it subsequently formed the basis of the BMW NASCAR supercar concept, while Marc Bechamp of Bettoni was unable to deliver a concept car in its final form potentially due to Artioli not finding the concept innovative enough, the overall winner of the competition being Marcello Gandini, whose resume with supercars included such classics as the Di Tommaso Pantera, the Lamborghini Countach, and later the Lamborghini Diablo, his DMD-80 prototype employing a sharp and angular silhouette that featured scissor doors. With functional prototypes being assembled, testing of these cars was undertaken by Lamborghini test driver Loris Picocci, who had been brought in by Stanzani and was thrilled to be part of Bugatti's revival. The testing of the prototypes being conducted just prior to the grand opening of the Campo Gaiano factory on September 15, 1990, on what would have been Ettore Bugatti's 109th birthday, although the DMD-80 prototype was still under wraps, as despite having a state-of-the-art engine for his dream Bugatti revival, Artioli was still not content with the overall design, Gandini's prototype being seen as too aggressive on the outside and not innovative enough on the inside, a relic of the 1970s wedge era that took a few too many styling cues from the Lamborghini Countach, and thus, despite Gandini offering to undertake a redesign, the famed stylist was let go from the Bugatti project. 
the departure of Gandini, was representative of deteriorating relations between the men who had come together to form the revived Bugatti company. With creative and business-related differences between Artioli and Stanzani, resulting in the latter quitting the team in August 1990 and taking Technostile with him. But despite all progress on the project grinding briefly to a halt in the aftermath of Stanzani's departure, Artioli was able to reel in chief Ferrari engineer Nicola Matarazzi to take over where Stanzani and Technostile had left off. Matarazzi having been a highly experienced car designer with a plethora of legendary models to his name, including the Lancia Fulvia HF, the Stratos, the LC2, the Ferrari 288 GTO, and the Ferrari F40. Coming in to finish the project, Matarazzi brought with him Michelin test driver Jean-Philippe Viteco, who worked alongside Biocchi to test the running prototypes, with a view to releasing the first production models in time for Ettore Bugatti's 110th birthday in September 1991, initial testing being to iron out imperfections, but at a cost of increased weight, thus sending the team back to the drawing board. Artioli's continually high ambitions demanding a machine that married the latest in supercar technology with unmistakable Bugatti heritage, eventually turning to the aerospace engineering business to help bring the car's aerodynamics to fruition, employing the state-owned companies Aerospatiale and Composite Aquitaine to construct a carbon fiber monocoque chassis, the first of its kind ever built for a production automobile. With 1991 dawning, Artioli still hadn't formed a conclusive design for the car, and thus turned to Pavel Ramis, and Campo Gaiano's own architect, Giampolo Benedini, to rework Gandini's original design into something that abandoned the obvious Kuntash callbacks of the 1970s, but was still able to integrate a styling that was unwaveringly Bugatti, with proposals for pop-up headlights being ditched, and an integration of the famous horseshoe Bugatti grille into the car's low and finely tuned profile, continuous tinkering and altering to the car, resulting in the finalized EB110. Unveiled on time, September 15, 1991, the EB110 was presented at two glamorous ceremonies in Paris, which represented the car's blending of heritage and modernity, starting in the shadow of the brand new Grand Arch at the heart of the La Défense Financial Centre. With the master of ceremonies being fellow Bugatti aficionado and one of France's biggest movie stars, Alain Delon, with Artioli's wife, Renata Kettmeyer, and Delon pulling back the wraps to reveal the finished car in front of hundreds of journalists, Campo Gaiano employees, and ecstatic fans followed by a two-car parade through the Concorde and the Champs-Élysées, and an 1800-guest event at the Orange Gardens at the Palace of Versailles, which was once the opulent home of the French monarchy, eventually concluding with a homecoming event at the former Molsheim factory. As Artioli was determined to give the revived Bugatti a true air of exclusivity above other car makers, he personally ensured that every example would be sold to who he deemed were the right people, which didn't necessarily mean the world's super rich each prospective buyer being interviewed and subsequently approved or ruled out, while the delivery process came with adequate training and demonstration from a travelling team of mechanics, the initial model, the EB110 GT, entering sales at $350,000, or 722400 in 2022, while in 1994 the car was followed by the EB110 Supersport, which offered a more focused driver's car. Just as spectacular as its development and release, the EB110, unlike other high-publicity sports cars like the DeLorean or the Brooklyn SV1, was able to match its fanfare with the advanced technology and mechanics claimed by its builders, adopting a carbon fibre monocoque chassis in favour of a regular aluminium chassis due to it being too flexible, the aerospatial-designed carbon fibre monocoque possessing far greater structural rigidity and weighing a mere 275.5 pounds while the overall car, thanks to this design choice, weighed only 1.6 tonnes, an incredible feat considering its complex aluminium body and four-wheel drive transmission, the car being more rear-heavy with a weight balance of 60-40 towards the back. For power, the car adopted a bespoke unit developed by Technostile rather than utilising an existing engine, the resultant power plant being a longitudinally mounted 3.5-litre quad-turbocharged V12 sporting 560 horsepower this engine being a catalogue of unique technical solutions in order to deliver optimal performance, including the use of five valves per cylinder instead of four, three intakes and two exhaust valves, a configuration which, at the time, was reserved only for Formula One racing, and the four turbochargers working in a sequence operating at 1.05 and 1.2 bar, the first pair of smaller turbo spooling in the lower RPM range, while the larger pair activated above 5,000 RPM giving an incredible acceleration which was consistent up to the engine's limit. Married to the power unit was a six-speed manual transmission distributing power to both axles, this unique unit integrating the gear train into the engine block 
and placing it alongside the crankshaft case, meaning that power loss from the engine to the wheels was kept at a minimum, while the prop shaft running towards the front of the vehicle is then connected to the coupling unit of the front axle. Power delivery and balance for the car, based on Vitico and Biyoshi's intensive testing, redistributing the EB110's transmission from the initial 4060 distribution to the more rear biased 2872 ratio, as the earlier distribution had caused the prototype to suffer notable oversteer due to excess power on the front axle. While the technology of the EB110 was universally praised, the car's styling was definitely an acquired taste, with only the side windows and scissor doors being the final remnants of Gandini's original concept. The finished aesthetic for the machine being almost entirely owed to Giampaolo Benedini, but still not fully satisfying Artioli, who, even in the closing months before release, had commissioned Tom Jada to undertake yet another comprehensive redesign of Benedini's redesign. But this was dropped due to the looming launch date, one interesting asset of the EB110's exterior being the two-piece windows, as, at the time, no glass could withstand the forces at speeds of 200 miles an hour. Offered in nine standard colours, and three additional special order shades, the EB110's looks were contentious to say the least, being neither the angular wedge looks of the Ferrari F40, nor the rounded windsmooth lines of the Jaguar XJ220, contemporary car critics listing it as something of a modern art masterpiece, but one which attracts either praise or derision depending on the taste of the viewer, an out there aesthetic worthy of the Bugatti name, as even the original cars of the 1920s and 30s dabbled with the concept of what could be conceived as beautiful in order to create an outstanding appearance. It was the performance of the car that truly made it stand out against the crowd of supercars, as aside from the roof CTR, which itself was a modified Porsche 911, the EB110 outstripped both the Porsche 959 and Ferrari F40, with a 0-60 time of 3.6 seconds and a top speed of 209 miles an hour, while the later EB110 Supersport of 1994 could attain a 0-60 time of 4.4 seconds and a top speed of 221 miles an hour, but by this point the McLaren F1 of 1993 had already stolen the title of world's fastest production car with a top speed of 231 miles an hour. Enthusiasm was incredibly high for the EB110, however, output was still being stifled by Artioli's insistence on closely monitoring the sales of the model, continuing to ensure that his revived Bugatti was being delivered to people who met his stringent judgement of moral qualities, not allowing his new car to simply be a plaything for the decadent super-rich. And while this righteous fortitude may be admirable, the company would be unable to maintain its financial stability if it continued along this path, and therefore more Bugatti models needed to be built to keep the firm afloat. Aside from releasing the EB110 Supersport of 1994, Artioli employed ex-Ferrari racing engineer Mauro Forghieri to help the company branch out into other markets, resulting in the highly ambitious EB112 luxury sedan concept of March 1993 which was to be launched for production in September of the same year, while Artioli's wife established Ettore Bugatti SRL, a luxury goods brand producing high-quality accessories, the biggest move by the revived Bugatti firm being to purchase the British sports car manufacturer Lotus from General Motors on August 27, 1993, at a cost of £30 million, Artioli's hope being to create an automotive empire equivalent to that of Fiat and Volkswagen, the purchase of Lotus bringing with it other ancillary advantages, as with its engineering expertise, the company could help revise the EB110 for the North American market. Unfortunately, the launch of the EB110 came at a time of severe economic uncertainty, starting with a recession in the United States during 1992, caused by the aftermath of the Gulf War, followed by what was known as the Lost Decades Recession, instigated by a stock market crash in Japan in 1993. The impacts of this economic upheaval on Artioli's real estate interests in the Far East, as well as a general downturn in luxury goods sales from the 1992 Global Recession, and the loss of his lucrative role as an importer of Isuzu and Suzuki cars into Italy, meaning he lost millions virtually overnight. While Bugatti continued to develop in association with Lotus, a US market version EB110, as well as making early motions into creating a dedicated model for the Arabian market, the slump in luxury car sales meant that, by 1994, the fashion outlet division, Ettore Bugatti SRL, was earning more than the Bugatti Automobili company itself, followed in 1995 by production of the EB110 grinding to a halt due to delays in the deliveries of new parts by contractors, rumour having it that Ferrari, employing its incredible influence on the Italian motoring scene, having forced small and big business dependent companies into stopping the supply of new parts to Artioli's Bugatti. This was the final straw for the revived Bugatti, and with Artioli unable to find investors to get the company running again, the firm collapsed into bankruptcy on September 23, 1995 
Although, in a principle unshaken by the many hardships of the business, Artioli maintained solidarity with his workers and continued to uphold a welcoming environment with his employees, ensuring that every single one of his staff were paid for the work they'd done, while the sudden closure of the plant left unfinished EB-110s on the assembly line and caught workers who weren't present by surprise as the only notification of the company's collapse came when they found their employee access cards had stopped working. Eventually, in April 1997, a bankruptcy auction was held at the Campo Gaiano factory with the name, associated trademarks, prototypes, machines, and semi-finished production cars being put up for sale, with four entities ultimately taking hold of Bugatti's assets, Volkswagen buying the Bugatti name and the trademarks, as well as the racing prototype of the EB110, the Monaco racing team buying a number of prototypes, semi-finished and finished cars, blank bodies and engines, and the EB112 concept car, Dower Racing buying the rights to the EB110 name and logo, as well as the cars on the production line, which included three EB110 SS models, several prototype cars, and a supply of parts, and finally B Engineering taking purchase of four finished cars, one prototype, and one engineless car. In the midst of Bugatti's bankruptcy, the majority stake the firm had in Lotus Cars was sold in 1996 to Proton, a Malaysian car company listed on the Kuala Lumpur Stock Exchange, and with the parts and engines sold off, a number of prototypes and late production cars were eventually brought to completion and sold to private customers by MRT, Dower and B Engineering, with Dower, having bought the rights to the name and the logo, taking it a step further by offering a redesigned and improved continuation model of the EB110, assembling these cars at the former Campo Gaiano factory. The eventual Dower EB110 was launched in 1999 once composite technology had progressed to the point that it allowed for easier assembly of the carbon fibre bodies this new EB110 being offered in full carbon fibre construction, which weighed less than 1.5 tonnes, while Dower's EB110 also included an adjustable rear wing based on the Supersport's fixed-wing design, and adjustments in the engine management, especially regarding the turbos, that pushed the power output to 645 horsepower and gave it a 0-60 time of 3.3 seconds, with a top speed of 230 miles an hour, the Dower prototype being able to lap the Nürburgring in under 7 minutes. Once Dower's supply of unfinished EB-110s came to an end, the model ceased production for the final time, with the Dower company itself later declaring bankruptcy amid the 2008 financial crisis, while Volkswagen, now in possession of the Bugatti name, established Bugatti Automobiles in 1998, commissioning Giorgetto Gigiaro and Ital Design to once again create a new range of Bugatti cars, including a luxury saloon car concept known as the EB-118 and EB-218, and a brand new supercar prototype known as the Bugatti Chiron of 1999, which, after years of development and refinement, would result in the spectacular Bugatti Veyron of 2005, the world's fastest production car, and one which illustrated the absolute pinnacle of automotive technology, being lauded by critics and customers across the globe, and making it one of the most successful luxury supercars ever created. Today, the EB110 is often forgotten among the supercars of the late 1980s and early 1990s, due to the fact it was built in such small numbers and sold to a very restricted clientele, with only 139 of these units built and sold by the time production ended in 1995. The car's somewhat understated styling, which presented a mixture of old and new cosmetics, belying its many innovative and unique mechanical features. In reality, the EB110 presented, through its superb construction, a machine that was able to marry luxury and performance in a manner not achieved by the preceding Ferrari F40 which sacrificed all refinements in its pursuit of speed, the Bugatti EB110 living up to the ethos of its namesake by pointing itself firmly at the future, its premature demise being a tragic conspiracy of timing on a global scale. Although in the failure of this brief supercar, new prospects for the Bugatti brand, as one of the preeminent sports car marks, would rise from its ashes, with the flagship Veyron again picking up the essence of Bugatti by not retreading the same ground technologically but aiming to create an uncompromising supercar that achieves the vision of the company's original founder.